Good morning. Welcome to worship with Fredericksburg Baptist Church. As we gather here this morning, we have been reading this past week about Jesus on the move. We've been reading about what it takes sometimes to get over ourselves, over the ways that we have been trained in our lives, the perspectives that we have, and the ways that sometimes those perspectives limit the love that God wants us to have for one another. So Jesus is going to be teaching us this morning. He's going to be stretching us. He's going to be asking us to move, to listen, to be open. So as we gather here this morning, I invite you, bring your heads your hearts, and your hands to worship our God this morning. Let the Holy Spirit move in you. Let's pray together. Holy God, you are so good. You are so good to create the world. You are the maker of us all. You give us one another, all people, to know, to have company, to have the opportunity to love, to see their creativity, to see their beauty, to see their sympathy, their empathy, their goodness, but also to see the difficult things too. God, we come here this morning to worship you for all things good and perfect that you have given us. And we also come to worship you for giving us a way when things are difficult, are imperfect, aren't whole, are divided. Lord, you are our all in all. We come here this morning lifting up our hearts, opening them wide to you. Enter in, Lord. We praise you. We love you. We are yours. Let the Holy Spirit move among us and let us know it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Please stand and join me for the call to worship. Come, know and worship the Lord, whose name is good because of steadfast love and faithfulness, the maker of us all, the one who provides what is needed, blessing the upright in heart, who are generous to give hope in the Lord to all people. Our trust and hope are in the Lord, who continues to have compassion and concern for the life of all that is created. Praise the Lord. Become praising and honoring our God with prayers and songs, proclaiming God's goodness that surrounds us and supports us. We come praising and honoring our God with open hearts, ready to hear and know how to do God's will and way of saving help that gives hope to all people. Today we have opportunity to gather around the Lord's table. And we also have an opportunity to hear God's word. And so let's take a moment to prepare ourselves for those two worship elements this morning by offering a prayer of reconciliation, making sure we've taken time to think about our relationship with God, also our relationship with others. Will you pray with me? Holy God, who sees and hears and is faithful with steadfast love to respond with compassion and mercy and justice needed. We admit that we don't always see our neighbor as ourselves, much less love them that way. Instead, we make distinctions, play favorites, and even neglect or ignore people because something about them challenges our privileges, our power, and certainties about the way life works for our personal good. With our biases and prejudices and fears, we appear to limit your love and mercy, goodness and justice, meant to be known by all people through us. Challenge our self-righteousness and fearful limits. Help us realize that our brothers and sisters for whom you are working to sustain life and bring flourishing life is the whole of humanity. Lord, forgive us for misusing or limiting your generous love and help because of biases and prejudices 
and fear. Open our eyes and ears and hearts to the needs of our brothers and sisters in this human family you've created. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and move us to act with your goodwill to bring help and hope without distinction. Help us discern how we can better participate with you to overcome others' distress and despair with your goodness. Will you take these moments now to pray? We give you thanks, God. Your heart tells us that you're faithful to forgive us when we ask and that you are eager to strengthen us in our repentance if we are sincere in our desire to reconcile our hearts to your heart of generous love for all that's created. Encourage us to be just. Encourage us to be loving as you are just and loving forgiving as we have been forgiven, merciful as you are merciful with all people. Knowing reconciliation with you and willing to reconcile with others because of your generous love, our hearts are at peace with you. Our hearts are open to learn your will and way of concern for all people. We are now ready to meet Jesus in the word. We pray that Jesus will open our ears, reaching into the deafness to others that we still use to limit our love and teach us faith built on generosity and impartiality that cannot help but do your good works that bring hope to all who you have made. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
as we continue to worship this morning through prayer, some of our church family members we want to remember. Jerry Schlayer has been in the hospital this week and is at home now recovering. Betty Truslow is in Mary Washington with COVID, and we want to hold her especially close in our prayers. I had a text from Becky Parker last night saying that her mom was very near seeing Jesus. And indeed, this morning, she sent a text. We learned that Elizabeth Britton has gone home with, to be with our Lord. We want to remember Becky and Bernie and their family in this time of loss. We also continue to remember the people around the world who are being affected by the pandemic, as well as people from the Gulf Coast to the Northeast affected by hurricane, people on the West Coast threatened by fires, and people in Haiti still recovering from earthquakes and storms. Let's pray together. Holy God of love, and giver of all that is good, we praise you. Oh, how our souls praise you. It is good to be gathered in person and virtually to worship you together. Thank you for the technology that has kept us connected all these many months. Thank you for preserving life in the midst of so much loss. Please, oh God, surround all who grieve be especially close to Becky and Bernie and their family members. Bless them with your presence in ways that comforts and upholds them. For all who struggle with illness and injury, we pray your healing grace everywhere it is possible. Be merciful to those who wait for your perfect healing grace. Surround each one with your loving care. We ask your blessings upon Jerry Schlayer and Betty Treslow this week. We ask your guidance, your care, and your love to be made known in the midst of all of the storms of our lives, both those internal storms that shake our sense of calm and those external storms that threaten the physical well-being of so many, affected by pandemic, fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, and tornadoes that spin off from them, and flooding. God, so many lives have been shaken to the core, and we pray that you will use us, your children, to demonstrate your love and your care. Help us to offer hope. Help us to pay attention to the ways that we can be most helpful with our resources, for they are all gifts from you meant for us to share. May we bless you as we share blessings with others. May we show mercy as you are merciful to us. May we show love because you first loved us. May our eyes be open to see you, and may we be kingdom builders with you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.
pray with me? Our kind Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for the blessings that you have given us. I'm most of all thankful for you, your gift of your Son who came on earth and died for our sins so that we could be reconciled to you. And Father, I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit that can become part of our spirit and that we can bear witness to the peace, the joy, the love, and the hope that you give us all. I pray, Father, that we will have the courage to step forth and not only live the life of a Christian, but to witness to others and to meet the needs of our neighbors, that we would take put into action that would give them love, hope, peace. Now, Father, as we come to this part in our worship service this day, we are offering back to you some of our financial and ourselves resources. And Father, that I pray that you will find us cheerful givers and generous givers because we know that all things come through you. And may you bless this offering that as we go forth to teach nations, baptizing them and naming them as a part of your kingdom, give us the courage and the strength to do so. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A reading from Mark. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, 
He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Shirley. And I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed having different readers of the scripture each week and how as they finish the reading, they say the word of the Lord and you can respond, thanks be to God. But when we came to the end of that scripture today and we responded, thanks be to God, to the gospel reading, I thought to myself, wait a minute, did he just call that woman a dog? Is that what we're supposed to hear from Jesus today? And the answer in short is, yes, he did. And it's a troubling passage. I've spent some time with it this week thinking about it. And while it may or may not be a sin to be rude, it certainly is poor manners. And it hurts our feelings thinking that Jesus could treat this woman this way. This is not the way Jesus is usually portrayed in the Gospels, is it? I mean, there are plenty of times where he says some harsh things to people, but it's always to people of power and principalities, people who are in charge of things. But he never, except in this occasion, he never says to a woman who's desperate, a woman who's asking for their child to be healed. I mean, this is a woman who is, is weak, and she's an outsider. She's not a part of the inner circle. And really, she just needed the healing touch of God. To her, Jesus said, It's not good to give children's food to the dogs. So we have to pause and wonder, what does that mean? What does that mean? I think it would be good if we took some time this morning to really wrestle with the meaning of this perplexing text and see if we can figure out what it is that Jesus is doing in this text this morning. I think in order to do that, we have to back up and we need some context to understand what's really happening in this passage. There are tensions underlying today's text. Partially a cultural tension between the Hebrew people and the Gentiles in the region. And you have to understand that this tension has been going on for a long time. Because there are at least 12 occasions in the Hebrew Bible where the Hebrew people call the Gentiles of the region dogs. It appears to be one of the favorite ways to refer to Gentiles. And I'm sure the Gentiles had their favorite slurs for the Jewish people as well, for the Hebrew people. So... When we can see Jesus use the term dog, we know it didn't just come out of the blue. It was a common reference to Gentile people. But still, I think that's pretty harsh. I even remember reading a scholar long ago who was trying to soften the blow, and he suggested that the word dog really meant puppies and that Jesus was being playful. Um... I don't think that could be it, can it? Our wrestling match continues with this text this morning. Let's get back again and take a really broad look at what's going on in this text. Let's remember what Jesus was doing just before today's lesson. We talked about it last week. Jesus is in an ever-increasing, tense argument with the powers and the authorities, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember, he has nothing good to say to them ever, it seems, in the gospel. 
Particularly in chapter 7, Jesus accuses them of being more concerned about what's on the external than they are about the things on the internal. They're more, they're, they're more concerned about the appearance of things. Now that may seem like I'm talking about you and me, but I'm talking about this group in the gospel lesson today. They were more in, concerned about the appearance of things than the reality of things. They're more concerned with the power, their power and position than they are with actually doing the work they were given to do. <clears throat> they are more concerned with the role of religion than they are about the power of religion to actually transform a person's life. In the chapters to come, Jesus will lay this criticism out very clearly. Some transformation has to happen internally. I did a funeral for a 26-year-old yesterday over in Culpeper. He spent four and a half years in prison for a troubled life. He was baptized when he came out of prison and he became the mayor of goodwill in Culpeper. 300 plus people came and all gave testimony of how he had changed so much and brought so much joy and so much happiness. One gentleman even stood up and said, he always told me when I wanted to quit to remember why I started. And his internals had changed such that he had changed and transformed lives all around him through the power and the love of Christ. It wasn't the external, it was the internal that made the significant change. And those men had loved him and those people of Culpeper had loved him when he started out as a tree trimmer. He had a truck, he couldn't keep it going, he couldn't afford to keep it going, so he sold it. He bought some tools with it. And you know what those men did? They went online and they found out that that very truck he sold was for sale in North Carolina and it was with its second owner. And it happened to be on sale. They drove to North Carolina and they bought that truck with money they did not have. And they brought it to that funeral and they placed his casket on the back of that truck and drove him to the cemetery. And they all sat on the back of that truck with his casket. And one of the meaningful things about it was, and you'll, you won't believe this, this truck that he had sold in order to get his business going had been through two owners. And when they bought it and drove it back from North Carolina, his things were still in it. After two owners, and his sunglasses were still in the visor. Jesus says to them, you're more concerned about the external threats to your power and purity than you are about your internal condition. What's your internal condition? You think that things that defile you are outside of you? In your profound concern about external threats, you refuse to see that there's real defilement that comes from you. It's inside your own heart. All the vile things in the world are born right inside the human heart and anything that comes out is just a reflection of what was there from the very beginning. That's the conflict that Jesus is in and he has this conversation with this Syrophoenician woman. This at least helps us understand that Jesus might not have been immediately receptive to her request. He was disgusted with them. He was in an argument with them. Perhaps our understanding of this passage is expanded further if we think about it in a literary way. Jesus is going to say something and then he's going to actually act it out. Watch. Jesus was asked for some, has asked for some privacy. 
Uh, he wanted to get some rest. And this fierce Gentile little mom comes in with her sick daughter on her mind and says, you are the source, Jesus, you're the source of healing my sick daughter. And he sees some, she sees something in Jesus. She doesn't know what it is, but she knows she knows he has the power and she wants what he has for her daughter. And so does what any fierce woman or mom with a sick child do. It's not nap time, Jesus. She bursts through that door and walks in and says, I need for you to heal my daughter. I need you to heal my daughter. And Jesus starts out by saying, it's not good to give food to the, of the children to the dogs. He starts with an accepted assumption. Now listen. The accepted assumption is she's an outsider. He starts by saying the same thing that everybody else around him has been saying. He starts with where they are. I'm not giving this precious thing to the dogs. He's calling them out. The fierce mom with great rebuttal says, yes, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. And clearly she sees things completely differently and she's not obsessed with the whole inside out thing at all. She wants what Jesus has. She wants it. She has no need of the external image of things. Can you see this literary thing rolling out for us? She wants, no, she needs the internal reality of God's healing power. She wants it. As in any other places in Scripture, Jesus is amazed at the faith perceived by this outsider. In this case, he's so amazed he simply accepts her rebuke. He accepts it as if it is actually, she is now actually teaching Jesus something. He seems to say, oh, well, for saying that, you have what you ask. Your daughter is well. Your daughter is well. Now, continuing with our literary interpretation of what happens next, the very next thing that happens is appears at first to be an interruption to the narrative that we have going on. Jesus is confronted with someone who cannot hear, who can't understand, who can't even speak. Jesus puts his fingers in this man's ear and he says, Ephatha, be open. Ephatha. And Jesus takes his finger out of the man's ears and, and he can hear and he can understand and he can speak. Do you understand now why these stories run contiguously? Do you see the movement here? The people Jesus is in conflict with, they're closed off. They can't hear. They can't see. They are concerned with everything outside of them. And everything outside of them is dangerous. And everything inside, we've got to protect. Because this is what I want. I want to protect what I want. And I need to be fearful of everything that's outside of me. He has this encounter with this fierce outsider and she flips the whole inside outside thing on its head and what is inside comes out and there's healing. And all of a sudden we like the deaf man can hear what he's saying. We can understand. Now we get it. I think this story in its contest, actually works to open our ears as hearers and to open our hearts to see what Jesus is doing in the world. Jesus, by coming into the world, is turning the whole world inside out. He's turning this inside out conflict within each of us on its head. 
It's flipping that part of us that's utterly convinced that we have what we need. Our understanding is settled and complete and everything outside of us or unlike us is dangerous. Everything that is outside of us or unlike us is threatening. Isn't that what you're hearing? When we believe that everything outside is to be feared and that we already have everything we need for health and wholeness, we build up walls. We build up walls, literal and metaphorical. We create emotional things that separate us, assuming that we are safe and the other is dangerous. But actually, when we do that, we are in the most dangerous position of all. Because now the only thing we've got is us. And tragically, that is often the source of the real pain and the real sadness and the danger in your life and mine. But when we encounter Jesus, and if you're willing to encounter Jesus, even around this table today, and allow him to tear down the walls that we've created, we're cracked open. And the cracks allow all of us to get out then some critically needed evaluating of our love because of listening and seeing them in new ways allows the healing power of God to come in, to come into our hearts, to touch what is broken inside of us, to heal that which is sick, to exercise that which has possessed us, to open that healing power of Jesus to every one of us in this room and online this morning for participating with God to show compassion, to show concern toward healing and restoring all that is created, but especially the people bearing great distress and abuse in our communities and in our world. And we say, oh, I understand that. I can see that, or at least I do. And almost magically, it loosens our tongues. And as Larry prayed this morning, we can speak with spirit-filled gospel truth of God's love for all into our culture, into our ethnic divides, with our minds, our hearts, and our hands. When we put down our defenses and we break down the walls and open our hearts to God's presence, we are changed. There are only people created by God who need to be fed love, grace, and mercy. That's who they are. All those on the outside just need to be healed by God, like this woman, like this woman's daughter. And they need to be welcomed at God's table in the sanctuary, and in the world through those who claim closer relationship with God because of their frequenting this sanctuary. Once we let go of the whole inside-outside obsession, we will be able to speak about the power and the healing and the freedom that comes with a spirit-filled life through Christ. We can be fierce, yes, We can be fierce in advocating for those who are in need. We can become healed healers, ready to show the evidence of our transformed love with openness and empathy to the plight of the people of the world like Troy I spoke of yesterday in Culpeper. Let go of your inside-outside obsession. Be free to participate with the love of God that moves us past all the external boundaries that says, I have everything I need and everything outside threatens what I have. Will you hear the word of the Lord today? And will you take up the healing evidence of what Jesus has made possible in you? And for you. Will you? 
I think this may be a good point for us to pause and to pray and consider what it means to gather around this Lord's table and if we are ready. God invites you. God invites us all. Will you join me there? you I want you to understand whenever you take that little thin strip off and reveal that wafer which represents the body of Christ that that's really a holy moment because this is what covers the body and blood of Christ we reveal that we come into the presence of remembering the holiness of God through Jesus Christ. We take that wafer. Holy God, as we hold this element, we take hold of the healing power and healing grace offered to each of us. Help us to crack open to be filled with your love in such a way that we can set down those boundaries, those things that cause us to mistrust others so much so that we exclude them from the table. God, forgive us. Help us to be made whole and help us to be an inviting, loving person like Jesus. Forgive us of our sins, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus took the bread, he broke it and said, This is my body, full of grace and mercy given for all. Do this in remembrance of me. And God, as we hold this cup, we know that it represents blood that was shed for our sin. I don't know anything else to say, but thank you from the bottom of my heart. And in doing so, I'm opening my heart fully to you to say thank you, and I want to be more like you. Help your love to spill out of me and out of us such that the whole world may be drawn to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He took the cup and said, This is a new covenant I make with you, full of grace and mercy, given for all. Do this in remembrance of me. I am grateful to be able to share that with you. I am hopeful to be able to share that with more and more of the world. Will you help me invite them? By the way you act, by the words you speak. As is our custom, we like to pass the peace at the end of our sharing at the table. And so, not to speak, go across the aisle and speak to one another during this COVID pandemic. But would you stand and would you turn to those all around you and tap your heart and say, the peace of Christ be with you. Will you do that with me now? It feels good to be able to offer the peace of Christ to one another. And as we now proclaim our opportunity to go out and to share the peace of Christ with the world, I invite you to sing this hymn, Lord, you give the great commission. Commission to go out and to share the peace of Christ with the world. Would you profess your faith this morning? Would you 
become a member of this church, would you rededicate yourself to this? Let us sing together. and ears have been opened to the will and way of Jesus, who crossed boundaries, challenged perceptions, and worked miracles because of bearing the message of God's great love for the world. Go out now to invite others to the table of God's generous love with your goodwill and concern. Let no one think that they are more worthy or less worthy of God's favor or concern because of your biases, prejudices, and fears. Get over your limited love and zealously proclaim the goodness of God to care for all people with your words and deeds. We go out to love and serve the Lord with hearts open and ready to be generous with goodwill and concern for the well-being and security, the peace and rest of all people.